and I are going to talk today about crop intelligence, what it is, um, what we are accomplishing or trying to accomplish. And uh, today we're actually going to look at Chelsea and Demo field of data, right? Yeah. Just yeah, it's just south of town here. Or south of town. So we're not going to bore you with PowerPoint slides for the next hour and a little bit. We're going to actually go through what we're doing and then go and talk through a live example from last year. And I think Chelsea and we can see that there. Yes, correct. So today, as Chelsea mentioned, um, I'm Ryan, and my role is the business development lead for Crop Intelligence. Um, Nelson Solberg is here. He's been part of Crop Intelligence right from the start. So in 2016, we had a field day and realized that we had to put proactive insights to soil moisture and weather data. We had a whole bunch of information. It was good to look at at the end of the year, but we weren't using it proactively throughout the growing season to make decisions. So that's what started with crop intelligence. Um, Nelson was with Alberta Agriculture for how many? 17 years. Agritrend. Prior to that, I uh, you know, the University of Alberta for full uh, time, a part time. 15 years in university or so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole long story there, I'll tell you what. And then uh, with the Agritrend for 15, 16 years. Okay, and uh, I got my start at Precision Egg in about 1996, and I'll show you a picture of that as we get through the slides. So we've been doing this for a, for a while, and I just wanted to give you a snapshot of our dedicated team to crop intelligence, whether it's the hardware, um, the software, or um, you know the agronomy. And we want to talk today primarily about the agronomy and the results from the data, and, and that's our goal. So. We do believe fairly strongly that we can actually have an influence from environmental data or soil moisture data from every one of the five production steps. So, growers in the room, who are the growers that are here? Put your hands up, you're not shy, like I can see you. Okay, so growers, um, agronomists. How many agronomists? You two, put your hands up. Oh, he smokes. Okay, so awesome, and then the rest of you must be sales guys looking to sell you. You're making Yeah. That's good. <laughs> So I think um, you're going to see, or I hope that you see, that it takes the entire industry to make this work. The grower, the agronomist, the equipment optimization people, our nutrient manufacturers, we're going to talk about a little bit later on the decisions that you guys are going to make. So we're going to give you examples of some of these. So just to start with, today officially we've integrated four different hardware platforms into crowd intelligence. So we started with the John Deere Field Connect in 2014, then Tesla Instruments, uh, Metos product, which Chelsea has at the back, so the EQV3 or the IMT. We integrated recently to Realm 5, which is a company out of Nebraska that has actually branded our own crop intelligence data logger. For us and any of you that own a Davis weather station that's on the Davis Weatherlink software, you can actually take a John Deere Moisture Pro plug it into that Davis weather station and not have to buy new hardware just to do crop intelligence. So officially there's four hardware pieces that are installed or integrated. Anybody here working with Crop Pro, Crop Domestic, Swap Maps, a couple. So we have formally integrated our data from the weather station and moisture pro to their swap water program. So if you're a Crop Pro partner today, uh, that might be something you want to look into. And for the John Deere lovers in the crowd that are using Off Center, which is all of them, Chris, right? Where's Chris? Um, I thought everybody's using John Deere Off Center. We have lots of requests to integrate weather data into the My John Deere and uh, the operation center. So we will see that integration happen here, hopefully by the first of July. Anybody using Ag Expert software? Ag Expert field, Ag Expert accounting. So some requests there also. So that is fully functional as well, Ag Expert software and any granular business you want to use in the room. Granular hub doesn't see anybody in Alberta or Chelsea. Lots of Saskatchewan. So that's another financial software weather data. So to give you a snapshot on equipment, so there was about 1,200 sites in the system in 2021, and that just gives you an example of the spread of hardware. So John Deere weather stations, Realm 5 weather stations represented not quite 50%. Pestle instruments, there was 587 last year, so just over half. And then because last year was the first year we integrated Davis, there was only 12. 
and that continues to grow. And then the moisture probes, it's no secret that our favorite is the John Deere probe. One, because it's, it measures a larger diameter of soil, so we get a better reading. Number two is we can service it. So if the sensor fails, uh, and this box here is an example of the probe installed in the grounds, if one of those sensors fails, we can actually replace it, not the entire probe. So what happened when we introduced crop intelligence? I just want to share this. You know, this is just when we started, 2014, 15, 16, we kind of got to the point that we had really good data, but we weren't using it proactively. And so we introduced crop intelligence in 2017, and then that's what happens when we actually were giving proactive insights through the growing season. So that's what we're here to share with you today. And this is back in 2001. We were playing with weather stations back then also. So the growth has come from our partners. So we have hardware partners and agronomy partners. Some partners do both. But it just gives you an example of the coverage in Western Canada. And of course, Martin Hill has played a, a very important role of that for us in the northern part of Alberta and uh, the agronomy groups as well that are making their recommendations from the, from the data. So there's the footprint of where we exist today. Every, every dot on there represents a probe. And we love to grow wheat and canola, or at least we love to grow, use crop intelligence in wheat and canola. Often because it's the two crops that we can make an agronomic decision or action in season. It's the two easiest crops to use, right? So we directly impacted last year not quite 1.5 million acres. And we'll um, go on to this slide, which is probably the most important to me. So we developed a product, and it really is important to us that if you bought crop intelligence or you're working with one of our partners, that you're using it. So the green line or the green dots are the customer user engagement by month. So January, February, March, when you're Phoenix or watching hockey, you don't check your weather very much. But if you, once the probe was in the ground, everybody becomes a happy clicker looking for the rain events. But that's the usage curve of our customers in 2021. And very interesting, the agronomists that are partnered with our customers making decisions. These are higher right now because the agronomist should be looking at the tool, helping you make fertility planning decisions, things like that. So, we do track the usage, so if you get set up on crop intelligence and you're working with Chelsea and you're not engaged with it, we want to understand the reasons why. So this slide is going to drive most of what we're going to talk about later today. Is This is the evolution of a crop intelligence customer. So often we start with just a weather station, checking the rain, wind speed for spring, uh, maybe soil temperature if you're doing anhydrous, maybe leaf wetness for disease risk. And you add a moisture probe, and I'll point out here that this is the probe installed in the field between the seed rows. That's, the, that's where we want it. We want to measure the best root activity we can as possible. So we install it between the, re, the seed rows. And what happens is we get to this one, two, three year plateau of I've got a whole bunch of data, I've learned a lot, but now what's the next step? How do I get to be more proactive and, and use it in different ways? And we want to have a conversation with you today about getting over here. Applying the knowledge, driving your yields higher, and the advanced agronomy where your soil testing, your tissue testing place in the growing season, and ultimately at the end, getting your own report card for your water use efficiency for canola or wheat or whatever crops that you're growing. And that's what we're going to show you. So we're here to talk about that. So. The basic level of crop intelligence is just environmental data. Wind speed, wind direction, temperature, humidity, spray conditions, frost. Most importantly for what we want to focus on is the boots on the, on the ground, agronomic decisions from soil moisture data, and root activity. And we'll dive into Chelsea's field here in a little bit and talk about the soil test and the root activity below ground and how that can help you make some decisions. So we're going to focus on the moisture probe. So we brought the probe box up front here as Elson talks through some soil tests and stuff. In a few minutes, we'll relate to where that root activity is and the soil test values with you. So what we do is really we're modeling water-driven yield potential 
based on soil moisture data. We're focused on crop available water, 30 year historical rain patterns, and trying to generate for you what your water driven yield potential is. So how many in the room soil test? They're either really good or they're all lying. Also. That's a big number of growers soil tests. And what's the average amount of people that soil test in Western Canada? Well, maybe 15%. 15%. Yeah. So awesome. Really awesome. So we want to set a specific, site specific baseline for soil moisture, change your thinking around setting fertility goals. And I'm going to show you crop health integrate. Uh, integrators from below ground will show the reactivity. And then we've got agronomy partners, financial partners, like uh, we've got the credit unions in Saskatchewan who are using the soil moisture data for lending, insurance reasons, there's lots of things. But we're going to end today focusing on water use efficiency and the report card for your farm per crop. You want to do this one? Yeah, you do good. I'll chime in here. Okay. So what we're focusing on is a soil moisture value. So what's the soil texture here, Chelsea? Well, this, this is a more of a, like a loam soil. Like, yeah. okay, it's a loam or clay loam. So yeah. if you get a moisture probe, a volumetric water content moisture probe, that's giving you a reading of 20%. It means something different in every soil texture. And I think in Chelsea's field, we notice the difference in the top eight inches to what's below. So if you look at this dirt box, here's eight inches right here. Yeah, so the top is a loam soil and the bottom is what's below Chelsea, clay loam? Clay loam, clay loam. And there's actually a little bit of a sand in there too. And sand. So if you look at sand, it really doesn't have a lot of water holding capacity. Your loam has quite a bit and your clay loam has more. So we want to be able to set or we can set by individual sensor depth to what the water holding capacity is for that probe. So when you install the probe in the ground in the spring, it's going to give you a number when it comes online that there might be six inches of crop available water to grow your crop. And it'll also help you understand where that water is in the profile. It might be all at the bottom or at depth. It might be all at top from winter recharge. And if you've had a dry year like last year, this middle sensor might show you that you've got a dry area here that hasn't recharged yet, but you'll be able to see that on the ground. So I just interject a little bit. So Ryan said if you've got six inches of crop available water in the meter profile, the crop can access that moisture and it really doesn't care if the water's in the soil or comes from the sky. So there's a few numbers and this might be a little bit repetitive, but it takes four inches to grow the factory. So the factory is all of the crop growth until the first bushel. It takes four inches to grow the factory and then every inch after that contributes to yield. And on average across what 3,100 probe years of data something like that um, you can expect to grow seven and a half bushels of hard red spring wheat per inch after the factory and 5.6, 5.7 bushels of canola per inch after the factory. So then that becomes the report card for you guys is that if you're doing less than that, then you've got some uh, opportunities to find out what's blocking that yield potential. Um, conversely, if you're at that number, you're doing pretty good. And if you're above that, you're doing excellent. And so those are kind of the, the numbers that you need to lock in your head. Four inches for the factory, 5.7 bushels of canola per inch after the factory, seven and a half bushels of hybrid spring wheat per inch after the factory. And of course, we've got numbers for a whole bunch of other crops. And really, at the end of the day, it's just that simple. Ah. <laughs> so this slide is something that I put together um, 1992. So I don't know how many years that is. That's a long time. And it hasn't changed much over the period of time. And so what I tried to do back in the day when I caught the bug of trying to figure out water-driven yield potential, I tried to present the different management capabilities and the different soil fertility capabilities. And so when you're looking at the red bars, that's a poor manager, maybe with poor soil. 
the yellow bars is where the management's better, and maybe the soil's better, and the green is where the management's great, and the soil is great. And so, strangely enough, uh, 30 years later, that those numbers still pretty much hold. Um, and really, at the, end, at the end of the day, when I first developed this thing, I was using a brown moisture probe. Has anybody got a brown moisture probe? Does anybody know what a brown moisture probe is? It's just Bill Chapman, well, he's older than dirt, so that makes kind of sense. He's got one of those. But that's another really powerful tool that you can utilize to identify what your water and yield potential is. So we said it yesterday, we may as well share today. These were the John Deere customers. And oh, that's right. All the I forgot about that. Yeah. We won't do that today. I'm just the around this right? And so the other reality that we all face is what the genetic potential for the genetic yield potential is of a crop over here from max yield. So 100% of yield, what our water limited yield potential might be. And in your area, you guys have too much water at times, right? So what impact can that have versus what our actual yield is? So are this water use efficiency we talked about is really, how do we understand to lessen that attainable gap? So this is an example of a customer of ours near Regina. They've got their land bases spread out a little bit. So they've got a farm that's a little bit further to the north, one that's kind of in the middle, and one that's southwest of the other farms. And so when you look at the three areas in particular, the top farm line used four and a half inches of soil water through the growing season. They started at 8.3 inches at the start of the year through that entire one meter profile. And at the end of the year, they only had 3.8 inch, inches left. We removed the probes just before freeze up. So in this case, this would have been about end of October, first week of November when that probe was removed. And farm two started with 7.8 inches, ended with the same as the other one, 3.8. And this farm three started um, with less at 7.1 and ended with less at 2.1. And when you dial that into what he grew for canola, for example. So he grew 4.3 bushels of canola for every inch of crop available water that he had, and the system average is 5.7. So that is his report card on that specific farm for canola. On farm two, he was 3.7 bushels of canola for every inch of water that he had available that year. Again, the system average is 5.7. But look at his lentils they're actually exceeding the system average on the lentils. So whatever they're doing on the lentils, keep, he needs to keep doing it, and uh, maybe increase that number even if it's possible. In farm three, the water you see early crop. The bushels per inch of water, sorry, is 4.6, and the system average is 5.7. So this is what we're learning with growers that have had a probe for two, three, four years. You know, how can we dial into these numbers and get this from 4.3 to 4.6 or 4.7. So this is especially important for the younger farmers and the younger agronomists in the crowd. And there's a lot of young agronomists. When you see these kind of numbers, it's basically a farm report card and what it's begging is for you as the grower or you as the agronomist to dig a lot deeper. Why am I only growing 4.3 bushels of canola when the system average is 5.7? That's a big difference at the end of the year. And especially when canola is, what is it off the combine now next fall? It's all, high, yeah, but what number? It's still like 22 all bucks. Right, so that's where you got to dig deeper, and that's where the advanced agronomy stuff, the piece of the equation comes in, where your soil sampling and your tissue sampling multiple times, and you're sampling old tissue and new tissue, and you're trying to think like a plant. It's essentially, that number is a farm, report card, it's a field report card, and you can make all kinds of deeper agronomic decisions based around that one number. So, value of having a probe year over year, one thing we learned is what your true overwinter soil moisture recharge is. So this is a farm in, what, in the western part of Manitoba, but it's a good example regardless of where it is. So the fall of 2018, when we removed the probe, we get an ending moisture value, just as you saw here, the ending moisture value. 
So we remove the probe and we have an average number of, I think that says 115 millimeters of soil. And then when we put it back in the ground in the spring, the, the average on that farm was 220. But some fields were 250 and some fields were actually 150. So rotation planting, barley, peas, lentils, pulse crops, always leave more moisture in the ground than a wheat or a, or a canola, always. Chickpeas are terrible for what they leave in the ground. So you get this trend over time of fall, spring recharge, fall, spring recharge, and so on. And this farm's average overwinter recharge is very specifically three inches of overwinter recharge. So you can, they can start to bank on that, which lets them use this part of the tool, which is the 2022 or next year fertility. Ryan, can you just back, back, one step, back to So for this particular farm, the average recharge is three inches, which for most growers, that's kind of is, is kind of unexpected because a lot of growers, a lot of people think that the snow just melts and runs off. It's not true. So the average recharge across the entire network is actually three to five inches. And it becomes very farm specific. It becomes very field specific and it really is really quite simple. So if I've got a cup, if, if this is a field and this field is empty of water, I can pour a lot of water in here, or better yet, a lot of beer in here, right? If this glass is full, I can't put much beer in here. That's basically what it boils down to. So the average recharge across the entire network of what's going to be next year, 1,200 probes-ish, is three to five inches, and you can take that to the bank. The only qualifier for the younger agronomists and farmers in the crowd is just the simple fact if your glass is full, not much is going to go in. If your glass is empty, a whole bunch is going to go in. Does that make sense? Because these guys actually um, are in a winter area. This farm, so this was his data that was submitted to his insurance provider. And apparently you can buy excess moisture insurance in Manitoba. And so, he used his overwinter recharge trend versus where he ended in the fall of 2021 to decide whether he needed to buy what level of insurance or not. So based on the soil moisture data and the trend over time, he chose the, the 54 cent premium package which saved him about 23 an acre on his insurance. And so this is a quote from Ron. This is Ron Cron from Manitoba. So on his 10,000 acre farm, just an insurance decision alone, um, that's what the soil moisture data was helping him decide. Now it's tough for me to show that slide around Regina because it's quite a bit drier there. Question? Um, Alton, you said a lot of people think the water runs off, that's not true. Have you done tests where there's a lot of frost in the ground? Do you think there's a little water source that's drier here with how much frost? How much action is something that's really not in this light, but when I was working with Alberta, University of Alberta, I, I took hundreds and hundreds of soil samples and hundreds and hundreds of those kind of samples. And the correlations were not very good. The correlations were not very good. So sometimes it sucked in, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> you know who is doing some of that work right now is Phil Harder from the University of Alberta. That's right. That's right. So if you've ever had a chance to come to the, or get a chance to come to the Crop Intelligence Summit, we have people like Phil Harder, who's a hydrologist at the U.S. that's doing that research right now. And I've never seen this before, so I, I just learned something again. Um, I don't know if you guys can take insurance with too much water, can you? Might be something to think about. So it is a real pretty powerful. Yeah, we now have some specific policy. Yeah, I've never seen this before, right? It's been it's been holding on. on. <laughs> <laughs> been hanging out with me in the dry area, sorry. So, one of the other tools that um, the team developed uh, two, three years ago, and it was really what does next year's potential look like based on the water we have. So this, what we call the next year potential or 2022 potential, so we, we take the measured amount of water that's in the soil at removal time, and this is the 30 year average over winter precipitation from Environment Canada. So from November 1 to April 30th, 
at this specific site was 4.9 inches. And what's the in-season average precipitation from May 1 to August 15? So 8.6 inches. So if we know what's in the ground, and we say, well, I'm only thinking I'm gonna get 75% of this number, or maybe only 50 or 75% of it's gonna go in the soil because the glass is already half full. And then you, you weigh your options on, well, if I only get half the rain in season than, than what I would normally expect, come down here to 50% of average in season rainfall, I have water to grow a 53 to 61 bushel wheat crop, or 75% of the rain goes higher and 100% of the rain and so on. So, and from my opinion, this is the most powerful piece of the whole system because in November, of last year, Roar knows what his yield potential is on a field by field basis. And he can start to do some planning. I used to call this sexy, or I actually used to call it agronomy porn, but I got slapped in the wrist for doing, using that word. But this is really powerful stuff because literally in November, you know what you're looking at, uh, plus or minus a hand grenade for next year's yields. And uh, the guys that have been on the program for a while have used this feature a lot. So they can be in Palm Springs or Mexico or wherever and they're dialing in what their yields are going to be next year with a fair bit of certainty. So another interesting question. So how many of the Martin Combine Optimization team is here? Okay, quite a few. How many of you guys, what drives your decision on your stubble light when you're combine today? How do you decide how high to cut? Just let the button, hit the button and let it rip. No, this is a serious question because so how high, how do you determine what your stubble mix should be on a normal year? So residue, should be asking. So residue might be something, um, you're trying to catch snow, but the reality is, is for every extra inch of water that you can catch with stubble, or if you're already saturated in the fall, I don't want to catch any extra water. You know, for every extra inch of water in the soil, could develop <coughs> your water use efficiency is much more yield, depending on the crop. So when you guys are thinking about, go ahead. I know that is what Phil is specifically working on right now. Phil Harder is you. I can't answer that, but that, he is doing that research. But all I'm asking you to consider is the question, if you know those characteristics of your area, and you can relate it to this, that's the type of stuff we're wanting you to think about. At home, it's nothing for people to grab the pro-till and go and clean up the field. But what risk is that around Regina for snow caps when we don't normally have very much of it. Your area is different for sure, but just another thought. So before I turn it over to Elston for some deeper agronomy conversation, I want to leave you with a, a visual of the rooting activity of a crop as it relates to the sensor depth from the moisture probe. So each one of these lines is an individual sensor. This is the rooting depth that we measure of the crop. And focus on these values over here. So this is the uh, applied nutrient value at zero to six inches. And then this is your six to 12 soil test value. And this is the 12 to 24 inch soil test value. So this is two fields of chickpeas. Um, this is some work that we did with the Saskatchewan pulse growers and our agronomist Vanessa Bell put this together. But it's an extremely strong visual so if we can play this through the season. So on the 1st of June, we can see our profile in both fields is a nice blue color. There's quite a bit of water there. On both sides, you can see the root development so far that we're measuring. And on this side, it's less. So the June the 1st is there. June the 10th comes along. This field is advancing quicker. You've got roots in the top 10 centimeter zone where you've got good nutrient levels. 
the pet roots also entering an area and using water where we don't have quite as good nutrient levels. 10th of June, 20th of June, we can see the color is changing now at the top here, which is su suggesting that we've removed water and we're getting closer to wilting point of that soil type at that depth. Roots are still in the 20 to 30 centimeter zone, again in an area where a lower amount of nutrients. 30th of June, you can see the top has now reached wilting point, essentially saying that these nutrients are almost no longer available or extremely hard to extract any water or nutrients from there. Roots are now entering the 30 to 50 centimeter area. So how far down are we, Elston? 30 to 50? Okay, so that's the zone we're in. And the nutrient value here is low or very low. The 10th of July, the top two sensors, so now we're eight inches deep. So we're actually completely exhausted here, close to exhausted at the next sensor. Lots of water below, roots are still active, but the nutritional value down here is getting to be next to nothing. So I just wanted to leave you with that visual as Elson gets into the agronomy behind what we're doing and then we're going to look at some live data and relate that to maybe some in-season actions or different considerations. So just before I get into some of the nuts and bolts, I want to just explain something that's become uh, more and more important to me as I get older in my career. I've been at this for 42 years. I've been thinking like a plant for over almost 30 years. And the thing that we need to wrap our head around when it comes to the farming systems that we have in general across Western Canada is that most of us are into direct seeding or at least minimum till systems. And what that has done over a period of many years is it's concentrated most of the immobile nutrients in the top three inches of the soil. So when Ryan is showing you this kind of stuff, there, there can be roots there, right? There's roots up there, but those roots cannot extract the nutrients that are naturally in the top four inches or the nutrients that you've placed there, okay? So the, the critical thing for us as agronomists and as farmers is we have to start thinking like plants in four dimensions. So this way is two dimensions, depth is three dimension, dimensions, what is the fourth dimension? It's time. So you, you need to start thinking about that and then you need to start integrating those thoughts with this crop at what growth stage? Because at about the five leaf stage for a wheat crop, it goes from hardly using any water, hardly using any nutrients, to explosive growth, which is almost straight up. And in, in that explosive growth stage, if, it, if the top four inches of the soil are dry, it can't access the native nutrients that are in the soil in this top four inches, and it can't access the nutrients that you have applied. Now some of you are gonna be thinking, well, you know, Solberg, it's been wet here for a while. And the same thing would, would follow if this top area was completely saturated, the roots can't really extract nutrients there either. So you can use this information in both directions. The main point is, overwhelmingly, the nutrients that we have in our soil and the way we apply the nutrients confines those nutrients in the top three, four inches maximum. And as an industry, especially the younger growers and the younger agronomists that are in this crowd, we've got to start thinking differently and getting those nutrients down to depth some way, somehow, sooner than later, at least on some trials. And I know Gro is here, maybe that's something you guys can play around with. I'm gonna twist his arm to get you some cheap uh, probes next year. But that we have to understand that when we're coming out of the gate. We've got to think like plants. And my thinking that tillage is uh, better than no tillage? Well, occasional tillage might be a really cool thing. Just before COVID hit, I was in Western Australia. Um, and if anybody's been to Western Australia, you'll know that those guys farm big acres. The land is basically beach sand. They control traffic farm, but guess what they do every seven to 10 years? 
they rip and or they plop. And they do those for very specific reasons. Remember again, the guy that I was on, 20,000 acres, it's all controlled traffic farming, but every seven to 10 years, they'll either rip that land or they'll deep plow that land. So I've been an advocate of some occasional tillage for a long time because I can remember in 1979 when I was first a graduate student standing in front of some of the first zero till direct seeded trials in central Alberta, all the farmers that came to look at those trials would say things like, young man, you just don't understand. This is never going to work here. And I would just say, never is a long time. And then we converted to direct seeding. And now if you, if you suggest any other de uh, you know, deviation from that theme, you, in some rooms, well, that door is closed. In some rooms, you need to be close to the door and have your, your running shoes on. <laughs> because some people get really hostile. I hope nobody's hostile here. But anyway, when it comes to that whole thing, which nutrients are trapped up here? Well, it's the immobile nutrients. It's the, it's the phosphorus, it's the potassium, it's the micronutrients, the bulk of them. pH is most affected in the top three or four inches. Where, where are you guys placing your fertilizer? Some of you are old enough. Maybe Jack, you remember Deep Bander John Herapiak? Yeah, he put out more trials than you can shake a stick at. And the bulk of the trials that gave the best yield responses were two pass systems where nutrients were, be, were being banded at four and five inches deep. Unfortunately, John perished from cancer, but that, if you reviewed his research, that would, that, that would be what you found. And then continuing on, where are the roots active? Well, Ryan has already showed you some of that with the chickpeas. He's going to show you some real life examples here. But as growers and as agronomists, we need to learn the signatures of the root systems and understand where those roots are actively growing relative to where the nutrients are naturally or where they've been placed and start wrapping our head around that whole thing. And then where's the water? Well, the roots are usually chasing where the water is. And most importantly for much of Western Canada, what's the forecast? Decisions that would have been made in most areas last year would have been a lot different decisions than that were made in uh, the previous year simply because of um, the forecast. So just to give you an example, this is just one, I look at thousands of soil samples every year still, and this is just showing you how nutrients can be stratified, and so here's potassium, 151 over 90 over 58, this is pretty typical, magic number, the attention number is 150. But as the roots go down to chase water, they see less and less potassium. And when that crop is growing like gangbusters, say it's a canola crop, say it's a 60 bushel canola crop, how much potassium does that crop need to acquire on a day-by-day -day basis? The answer is most of you won't, won't know that. Most of you won't know that potassium is the second most important nutrient that we manage. Phosphorus, <clears throat> not a very strong number, and it gets worse with depth kind of what Ryan just showed you with the chickpeas. Sulfur and nitrogen, you don't worry about too much because what's different about them? They're mobile, exactly. And then you get over here into the micros, and this is typically what you see. Micros in the, sur in the soil surface are higher, and as you go down the profile, they decline. And so I think as an industry, when specific farmers on specific fields are only growing, say, 4.3 bushels of canola when the network average is 5.7 to 6, this might be part of the answer. And so basically, at the end of the day, what we're looking at, and this is from a plant's perspective, is up in the top four inches, we have a oasis of nutrients over top of a desert of nutrients. There might be lots of water here, but all the nutrients can be locked up there. And again, I'll stress, if this area is saturated, the same issue is going to apply. And that's just a little bit of a close-up. And the other thing that we need to think about is with mobile nutrients, the plant can suck those nutrients into its root system because they're mobile. But when you're dealing with P and K and the microbes, they're not mobile. So the only area that the plant can actually access the nutrients is when 
those nutrients are close to the roots. And so it's a double-edged sword. There's less nutrients with depth, and the plant roots have less capability of exploring that soil and absorbing those nutrients that are required during that explosive growth. Now here's a, an example from which farm? This is the demo we look at. The demo farm, I almost had a heart attack when I saw some of these numbers here. Look at the potassium. The attention level is 150. We're at 48 over 33, so I don't know. We might need to pay attention to a significant amount of potassium here. But we also have on the, on the phosphorus side of the equation, we don't have a, a very strong number in the top, and we have a less stronger number in, in the bottom, right? So this stratification thing is everywhere. The other thing I want to point out too, and we talked about this yesterday, we'll talk about, about it today, is pH usually is negatively impacted in the top three, four, six inches. That's usually where your low soil pHs are going to first appear for lots and lots of different reasons. And many of you folks in this room have got 30% of many fields that need to be addressing this pH issue through lime or wood ash or something. And sooner or later, especially for the younger growers and the younger agronomists, we've got to get focused in on this pH issue because it's a huge one. There's 20 million acres in Western Canada that are affected by low soil pH. So this is the first example when I ran into this. It was 1992 Ken Ferrian. Some of you might know him. He farms over near Fagerville. Um, and we were up out of his place. He'd already been direct seeding for 20 some years. We went in, this is the very first example. We sampled zero to three, three to six, and so on. And in multiple fields, we saw that most of the phosphorus is in the top three inches, and most of the potassium is in the top three inches. And this is something that we need to start thinking about. And the reason is this. We grow big crops, we suck up nutrients from the subsoil, it goes into the residue and the grain, the grain gets shipped off, the residue gets dumped from the soil surface. The nutrients inside that residue, PK micros, are immobile, they concentrate in the top three inches of the soil. This is from around Calmar. This is one acre grids. This is looking at a number of different things. We separated this field into one acre grids. We sampled each one acre grid for a number of stuff. But what all I'm gonna show you here is the soil pH. And in this field, in the top six inches, you can see any of the red and yellow stuff is where things are a little bit dodgy. And so one of the great opportunities for the young agronomists and farmers in the crowd is getting into fields that have lower soil pH, identifying what 30% of that field needs to be fixed, fix that 30% of the field, and that fix will last anywhere between 10 and 20 years. This is a little different shot of that same field where I actually went in and did uh, smaller increments and you're looking at potassium at the six to nine inch depth. So while we might have had pretty good levels in the top six inches, we're really in trouble down here. And so if you're thinking like a plant and you're growing during that explosive stage of crop growth and your root systems are down here, not up here, that's a problem for you as a plant. And these are just some specific grids that I pulled out uh, just to show the stratification. So if we look at potassium here, for example, loads of potassium in the top two inches, but as we go down in depth, it decreases. And you can see a similar trend with, with many of these others. Uh, copper is kind of a little bit dodgy, but typically it'll be higher in the top couple inches and then decline with depth. pH, well, the top two inches is not terrible bad, but then the next two, two inches is pretty horrible from a plant's perspective. So this stuff is going on everywhere all the time and it's getting uh, worse with time. So we consider the crop when it's growing. When it first starts growing, it's not using much water, it's not using much nutrient, but as soon as it hits this phase here from about the fifth leaf equivalent to flag leaf early heading, it's requiring horrendous amounts of water, it's requiring horrendous amounts of nutrient. And again, if we're looking at the signature, 
and the roots aren't active here, the crop's growing rapidly, it's down here, we better figure some stuff out. One of the solutions is some foliar application, maybe. Another solution might be some in-crop streaming, maybe. Some, another solution might be uh, front-loading that crop so that the old leaves hold a bunch of nutrient that can be cannibalized. There's quite a few agronomic options here. And that's the canola. This is wheat. Using the same concept, there's that explosive growth. And when that crop is ex growing explosively, it's using lots of water and lots of nutrient if it can access it. So skill testing question. We're growing wheat. How much, how many pounds of water does a bushel of wheat require to grow one bushel? How many pounds of water is required to grow one bushel of wheat on average? It's pretty quiet. <laughs> Yesterday's first guess was five pounds. I will tell you that was too low. 78 pounds? That's a weird number. That's the weirdest number ever. <laughs> Why 78? Yeah, okay. Somebody guess the other the, the other guess yesterday was a half a million, wasn't it? So we went from five to a half a million. What does that tell me as an agronomist? People don't know. The answer is fifty thousand. Fifty thousand pounds of water to grow one bushel. So now somebody is Googling and somebody is phoning a friend because <laughs> Allison's full of shit. But um, that's what it requires. Let's look at canola during that same growth. That was bad. 60 bushel of canola crop. It needs three pounds of nitrogen per day, two pounds of potash per day, one pound of phosphorus per day, a half a pound of sulfur per day, and 70,000 pounds of water per day on average when it's in that explosive growth. So again, the opportunity, the challenge, the conundrum, the me running out the door in my track shoes, question is how do we get those nutrients where the crop needs it? What agronomic things can we do to help that crop? And then we get to this piece of the puzzle. Ryan already talked about this. Different soils hold different amounts of water per foot. But I converted this to millimeters per four inches. And so when we're looking at the live example here in a minute, and we're, say, concentrating on a clay loam or silt loam soil, we're holding about 17, 18 millimeters of water in that top four inches of soil. And you'll see when a crop is growing like gangbusters here in a minute, Phil Thomas used to say when a canola crop is growing like gangbusters, it's using 9 to 11 millimeters of water per day. So it only takes a couple days to exhaust the water reserves in this top four inches, and then, my goodness, we have a bit of a problem if we're thinking like a canola plant. And I think this is where Brian comes back on. So any questions so far? There's been no rotten tomatoes or rotten eggs thrown at me. I see some consternation though. No questions? So while they're filling with that, so if the average number of pounds of water to grow bushels of wheat is 2,000, what happens if we could do some agronomic magic and grow that crop of 30 dollars? Grow a lot more grain, right? Same with canola. Canola is 67,000. Some of you guys are growing it on 50,000. And that's the whole thing. If we get the right nutrient balance from the plant's perspective in the system, then we can reduce the water requirements and grow more crop on less water as long as we've got the nutrients in balance. So that's the whole concept. Yeah? Okay, so Yeah. 
very complicated question, but a very excellent question. So the question basically is, you have a soil profile that has different soil textures to depth. And have we, within crop intelligence, identified the different mineralization of nutrients uh, based on those textures to depth? Is that close? Plus or minus a hand grenade? And the answer is crop intelligence hasn't, but many other people have. And so typically to oversimplify the sandy soil, most of the mineralization obviously is coming from organic matter. Some is coming from the mineral fraction, but the bulk of it's coming from the organic matter. So sandy soil typically will have a higher mineralization value than will a clay soil. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You are hardcore. Um, that's a really good question. I mean that in a good way, by the way. So, um, I have said to Ryan and the team multiple times that there's at least 24 PhDs in this project and many, many more master's degrees, and that's the kind of questions that need to be asked and thought about in research so that when we go from 2022 to 2052, we'll have, we will have doubled our yields and our profitability yet one more time, right? From the time I was growing up in that little dairy farm and the yields we were growing back then when I was maybe a little bit younger than you to what we're seeing today, like we've increased yields by a factor of three. And we need, at some level, to continue to think about that. And those are exact, exact questions that I wish every young agronomist and young farmer would ask. So good on you. You got a platinum star. <laughs> got my head going too. Okay, so we're gonna load Chelsea's um, Yellow field, and just talk through what things look like in season. So, Chelsea, you said you seeded May the 11th, right? So, I'm actually logged into the live uh, desktop version of crop intelligence. So, we're just going to go in and look at the soil moisture data for the purpose of today. And then, Elton can be found a white on or Mr. White on the 30 depths. And then, uh, oh, I'm good at So when you look at the soil moisture graph for the entire season, um, you see it on May the 11th, so you were pretty prompt to get the cold the ground by the look of it. So what we see here is a bunch of soil moisture graph lines, and, and ultimately what matters for today is the green line is the top sensor, the 10 centimeters, the yellow line is 20, the black line that you see on there is 30, blue is 50, um, the purple is 70, and the what is the light green on here is 100 centimeters deep. So we're just gonna talk through what the growing season looks like. So we often talk about the root signature of a crop. So canola will take typically 21 to 23 days from seeding date to reach the first sensor depth. So the, the green cap that's on there, that should be ground level when it's installed. So you're seeding your canola or your wheat, how do you see it? So seeding depth inch and a half, the first sensor is four inches. So in wheat or cereals, it's typically 14 days to reach that first sensor depth. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. I wanna show you the, really where the root activity is, starts to be shown. So I'm gonna go straight to May 25th. We were looking at this earlier just to make it quicker for today. So the 25th of May, this is what you would, as a grower or an agronomist would see from the information. So the green line, you can see, I'll just hover over top here. You actually can see the raw soil moisture values from the probe. So 38.26 is 38% moisture at the top and then 39 and 40 and 43 and you can see the values. And over on the right hand side, you see that blue column there. Um, that's the actual visual of available crop available water to the plant. So I'm going to turn on the rain button here because you guys actually had some extremely well-timed and 
a nice amount of rain early in the season last year. So we'll just jump ahead a little bit into June, to June 15th. And you'll see that you continue to have nice little recharges of rain. So just if I hover over the little blue bars that's coming from the rain bucket, but 3.8 millimeters of rain, then half an inch of rain. And you can see that green line going up. So you're actually the net 24 hour daily change. You can see the green line went up. So you're actually going from 32 millimeters of moisture to now 36. So that's what's been measured in the ground in the 24 hour period. So not all that falls from the sky always goes in the ground. The trash and residue on top works like a bit of a sponge. It also looks, works like a bit of an insulation blanket too. It's going to evaporate that off before it does anything else in the soil below. Then you got another very timely rain, 16 mils, recharge the top again. So really a perfect scenario for spring. A couple more little spots. But you see the green and yellow line is slowly trending downwards and you're going to see the explosive growth in a minute here that Elsa talked about. So we're going to step ahead in three or four day increments just to exaggerate that. So we're, we're going to go from Tuesday to Saturday and, and so on keep it consistent. So four days later, looks like you had another little couple shots of rain. So you're keeping that top couple of inches perfectly. Did you order irrigation, Chelsea? No? So it's so far it's perfect. 22nd, Tuesday. You see the green and the yellow line starting to tip. Right on there, maybe just point to that also. The green line has started to drop down, the yellow is dropping, and the black above it is also dropping. So that's telling us that the 24 hour net daily moisture change is reducing at each of those depths, which is what we refer to as crop water use. And the crop is probably just getting ready to get explosive. So you can also see down below, I'll get rid of a few of these to exaggerate it, but it's able to measure the net daily moisture change by sets of depth. So at the 10 centimeter you use 0.39, then 0.5. You can see the 20 is using more, and the 30 is also coming on. So if you're an agronomist who's scouting weekly or every 10 days, and you go show up in the field and you open this up, I guarantee you if you dig down to those depths, to the black lines of the third sensor, you will find root hairs down there. And Chelsea's got a great picture of the root pit that you dug last fall, too, to show that. So we'll go ahead now and go a little further from the 22nd to the 26th. And this is what Elson referred to as the explosive growth. You can see in only four days how much water was used from the top depth, the green line, and then the next depth, which is eight inches, the yellow. And you see this stair stepping in here. So this is crop water used through the day when it goes down. And then the flat line is really overnight when there's no transpiration in the plant. And then when it drops down again, it's crop water used through the day. So that's how granular you can start to see the growth of your crop. And again, we're using you know 1.67 mils from eight inches down, 12 inches down is 2.2. So it's really showing you where your roots are and so we had that soil test of Chelsea's right? Great. So we're about to enter that green the black line is now entering. Where's the soil test on here? We'll go back to it. Not quite a bit. It's locked up for whatever reason. So we'll have to maybe come back to it. Ryan, maybe quickly uh, tell folks what this green thing is. Yeah, so the green bar, the band in the middle is what would be technically called the fairway. If you were into irrigation, the fairway is the, the saturation point of the soil, is the top, and the bottom is the wilting point. So that band is really the, we'll call it the healthy band of moisture for the crop to use. So, so if I'm thinking like a plant, as long as these root systems are active in this fairway, right, so this is 10 centimeters, etc., we're probably up here accessing the nutrient-rich zone as well. So that's how, as, as farmers and agronomists, you can use this information to think like a plant where our nutrient systems are being accessed. So we're going to go from the 26th to the 3rd of July. So 
exposes that 26 to, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so what crop stage would, be, would you have been at Chelsea see on the 3rd of July? So if I go back to this image, this is work from Alberta Agriculture showing the amount of daily water you see. You spoke about Phil Thomas in canola. Yeah. This is now on uh, wheat. So if you're just about heading, Chelsea, you're up in where that crop should be using in that, or could potentially be using seven millimeters of water a day in total, right? So we can come down here and actually see the total daily water use right now has actually exceeded that. It's at 9.8. But it's see how it's trended upwards, and now it's actually trending down. And, and Chelsea, you mentioned this is an area of heat, too, so you can go back and look at the heat. But I don't know, Allison, if there's any considerations agronomically that, based on the forecast, and that your top 12 inches of soil is just about depleted from water. Well, if, it, if the crop is heading at this stage, you're probably just looking at manipulating protein. So we'll keep going. You see it here at the top. See? Well, but this is actually cool. So we would have had a look at the weather. Heavy rain in here. If we would have been looking at the weather forecast, say in this portion here, and it said no rain until over here someplace, uh, we would have maybe pulled the foliar application. If it said there was going to be some rain here, we would have maybe did some top dressing. Another possibility. But you're basically chasing protein now. So we'll just go ahead a few more steps to the sixth. And you see how the green and the yellow and the black have really kind of reached that flat point. There's quite a bit of, this is the temperature you talked about, Chelsea, right? So I'm going to bring the report on the, about the 2nd of July. So there is an automated in-season report, so you don't have to come and stare at this every single day. And these can be emailed to you or to your agronomist automatically on whatever frequency you you want. So this is the report. This is from July the 10th, but a couple key things. You know, the rainfall stats. So in May this year, you got 44 millimeters of rain, where the 30-year average is only 33. June, you were well below the average. You got 25, and you normally would have received 82. And so far in July, we're at 68 out of 83. But this daily moisture change over the last seven, seven days by each individual sensor gives you an indication of where the water is being drawn from in the entire profile. So three mils at the top, two, three, four, all combined to give you information as a grower and agronomist on what's actually happening with your crops. So, and here's the temperature piece. So if I just blow this up a little bit. The, orange bar at the top that I've got is a 30 degrees Celsius max temperature and the, the green bar at the bottom is a 5 degrees Celsius low. So this temperature stats over here is showing you in June you had three days that were above 30 degrees and you're actually currently ahead on your growing degree days. The 30 year average is 272 and that field is currently at 360 and in July there's already seven days above um, the 30 degrees. So what, why are we picking 30 degrees in wheat? Even better yet, what number would we pick for canola? So let's do the first one first. Why are we picking 30 for wheat? It's when the pollination starts to go sideways. Canola is 28, peas is 25, uh, corn and stuff like that will be 34, 35. This is something that I've learned over the last course of you know, a number of years is that when your plant is loaded with sulfur and boron, you can add three degrees of more heat resistance. So if Brian put in 33 degrees here instead of 30, we'd end up with a lot less days for certainly many, many less hours um, of climatic conditions that were messing up pollination. So it's, it's something that we should start playing around, around as we grow forward 
Uh, hopefully we won't run into an extreme heat year like we did last year, but that's kind of the general rules. Most of the literature that's been done with the sulfur and boron has been done in corn, but there's uh, more recently been some other literature, scientific literature, that's looked at wheat and canola and other more sensitive crops, but that's kind of what you can expect. Loaded sulfur plant, loaded boron plant will resist heat. Uh, two, three degrees for sure. Yeah, so the max on here, Elson, is like 32. And the summary over here says that the max in the in July is 33, so that little bit would have... So we could have avoided a bunch of that injury. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll jump ahead a little bit towards the end of the season just to give you guys a bit of a view of the rest of it. There was a sizable rain that came along in, uh, on the 17th of July here, so... Chelsea, do you remember how much it was? I'm not sure why it's not loading, then my computer seems to be locked up. You can see how much that rain recharged everything. We were all the way down to uh, almost wilting point, like below the 30, and then rain recharged you all the way up to the, the blue line down to 50 centimeters. So it was obviously a decent volume and came at a, at a slower rate. So that's just a look in deep at the, how granular you can get at the root activity of the crop and start to understand some of those plant health signals and maybe what you can do to an agronomy. So, and we could play with the data all day long because it's intriguing with leaf wetness and temperature and humidity and lots of those things. But, so that's the example I think that we wanted to finish with. And, Unless there's any other questions? Well, maybe just for the questions. Um, incidentally, Captain Fancy Socks has got a uh, project, a funding project that you guys can utilize if you're thinking about trying out this technology where the government will pay for half of the sensor data that's associated with crop intelligence and a whole bunch more. And these uh, pieces of paper are back at the, on the desk there. Um, and it's, you know, it's a no-brainer if you can get someone to help you look after those costs. It's half the price, so, and I think it's going to last for the next couple of years. Chelsea? It's also for three. Okay. So grab one of these, and that might help, help you with your decision. Also, this is a picture that Chelsea and the group, uh, they did a root kit. Yeah. And so one thing that is interesting is the texture difference. From top to so that is a, an area where you can actually set by each sensor what the texture is, and then we can blow these up on the screen at the back, and you can actually see the root hairs that are all the way, all the way down to one meter on that probe at the end of the year. See some here, whole bunch is there, whole bunch is there. Often when we pull this probe out of the ground at the end of the year, the, the probe itself will be wrapped with root hairs. You've seen that lots too, where you pull it out and you can see all the root. 